All right, welcome back to the channel. So the goal of today's video is to help you guys get jacked out of your fucking mind. <laughs> But in all seriousness, the goal of today's video is to talk about hypertrophy and strength work. We'll go over some of the theory that I like talking about, and then we'll go into some actual actionable and useful advice that I can give you, depending on which one of these two characteristics you want to train for. If you don't care about the theory, you can skip to like this number right here. I'm not sure how long I'm going to talk for, so I'm just going to put it right here. And it's also stamps below. So let's get into it. So let's talk about hypertrophy first. There's essentially two types of hypertrophy that we understand, sort of understand. This is myofibrillar hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Myofibrillar hypertrophy refers to the actual increase in cross-sectional area of your muscle fibers, like your actual muscles getting bigger. Meanwhile, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy refers to the increase in volume of the sarcoplasm, which is essentially like this liquid substance that your muscles are like floating on. You know, like your body's like 80% water, 75% water, I forget. So like things are not just there, there's always something that they're floating on. And this substance is where a lot of the substrates and the glycogen that we need in order to promote and sustain muscle contracture are stored. So for a while we've held the belief that reps on the higher end of the spectrum, you know, like past 15 essentially, will tend to promote more of, uh, of the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Meanwhile, reps on the lower range tend to promote more myofibrillar hypertrophy. You know, and there is some logic behind this. Like if you think about it, oftentimes your limiting factor towards those high rep ranges is endurance more than anything. Meanwhile, when we talk about the lower rep ranges, we usually are limited by our strength. So it would make sense for our bodies to create adaptations that would help us in either one of those tasks. So for endurance, it would make sense for our bodies to like prepare us by having more of the necessary substrates, enzymes and proteins that we need in order to promote and sustain contraction. Meanwhile, under lower rep ranges, it would make sense for us to develop adaptations that would allow us to exert more force, like have more available muscle fibers to recruit. This is still like speculative, and this is still an area of studies, and I can't really tell you that that's how things work. We just know, I just know that we've sort of held that belief because it sort of makes sense. And there's some interesting studies being done on it. I'm gonna link one below that I read this week uh, from 2019 that uh, creates some interesting hypotheses, even at one point stating that Perhaps sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a precursor to myofibrillar hypertrophy in some sort of way. And this also makes sense because it's like creating new tissue takes, I mean, it's a hard task on our body. So it would make sense for our bodies to like redirect uh, nutrients and like essentially the building blocks that we need in order to create more muscle to those areas. And a byproduct of that would just be an increase in volume of those areas. At the end of the day, hypertrophy is hypertrophy, you know, and we refer to this like, like the functional cross-sectional area because at the end of the day, whether your muscles are getting bigger because of the sarcoplasm that it's increasing in volume or whether because you're generating more muscle fibers, your muscles are getting bigger at the end of the day. And that's all that matters. Wait, now let's talk about strength. Now strength is a bit of a maybe like seemingly simple, but kind of confusing characteristic. You know, a big part of it will be dictated by genetics and simply you're like split of like fiber type one and type two fiber muscles. You know, and things as simple as like the part in which your tendons connect to the bone can have huge implications into how much force you're able to generate because at the end of the day, it's all levers. You know, if you're a power lifter or a weight lifter, you might already know this, but there's a huge neurological component to strength. Like your CNS's ability to recruit muscle fibers at which rate it can actually recruit these things. And also the ability that it has to coordinate different muscle groups in order to perform one task. You know, like a perfect example of this is like the final extension on your Olympic lifts. Like upon final extension, your central nervous system has to turn off your legs in essence. So they don't provide any resistance for you to go down into the bar. And at the same time, your upper body needs to turn on very, very fast in order to allow you to pull yourself under this falling object. But one thing we do know about strength is that you need higher intensities. <laughs> Ideally above 90%. <laughs> this seems to be like the magical threshold in which we actually start seeing uh, adaptations at the neurological level and all the type of adaptations that we do need in order to see predominantly strength gains. And that's it for the theory. So now let's get into the actual 
like practical advice that I can give you here. Now, we're gonna discuss hypertrophy and strength. Let's talk about hypertrophy first, because it's sort of like the easiest one, okay? So we know from several studies that the effective rep range for hypertrophy gains is essentially from five to 30 reps. Like that is a huge range, but if you can fall anywhere in there, you more than likely will be good if your goal is hypertrophy. For strength, you need to be working on the lower rep ranges, but we'll get into that in a minute. So for hypertrophy work, we have three main drivers. That is muscle tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. But the key component that I want you to focus on here is effort. So at the end of the day, the most important thing is how much effort you're putting into each one of these sets. So regardless of where you fall into the rep range, those need to be hard sets, like hard fought sets. I know this is a bit of an area of controversy, but I don't really think you need to go all the way to failure all the time. But I think there is some truth to the fact that that is the most effective rep range. Like whatever it is, go to failure, your absolute best. But it's been uh, explained in the terms of a curve. You know, there's a video by Jeff Nippard where he like quotes uh, Dr. Mike from uh, Renaissance periodization, yeah, RP. So, so what they're essentially saying is that, yes, absolute failure will be the most effective one, but falling one rep shy of that, it's not that much worse. Like it's marginal gains at that point. Okay, falling two reps short of that, yeah, you might see, leave, you might be leaving some gains on the table. Falling three, four, five reps from that, yeah, you're definitely leaving something in the table. So keep that in mind. We want good effort. An RP of eight or nine is still a very, very hard set. You know, it becomes a little controversial too, because it's like, you know, if it takes you three seconds to finish the last half of the rep, is that failure? Okay, what if you use a little bit of momentum and you can get another three? Will that be failure? Like, what are you considering failure here? Okay, so focus on effort. As long as you're putting a lot of effort into each one of those sets, you're probably gonna see results. And as far as all the guidelines goes, like they tend to say that uh, 10 sets per muscle group is what you need in order to see hypertrophy gains. But again, you can run into some controversy here because it's like, how intense are those sets? How heavy are those sets? So what are you doing during those sets? So it can vary, but for the most part, try to hit each muscle group twice a week. And this is where understanding theory can be useful because it's like, yes, you have this huge rep range, five to 30. And we know that you'll see hypertrophy gains all throughout that. Do I really know if whether it's sarcoplasmic or myofibular? Like, not really. Does it really matter? Mm, not really. But what happens when you actually start having issues? When the weight in the bar is not moving, you're not gaining any size, and you don't know what's going on, okay? It would be helpful to understand that even though we have these three drivers of hypertrophy, and they all arrive at the same end goal, which is increasing the functional cross-sectional area of your muscles, they all do it by different mechanisms. You know, so if you're in a plateau and I look at your program and all I see is three by 12s, then like I know that you've been prioritizing one specific channel of adaptation this entire time and it would be useful to change it. Okay, so you could start incorporating like heavier sets, like put more weight on the bar, pick up some heavier dumbbells, hit six reps. Okay, you might say like, yeah, but I don't feel the burn, doesn't feel like that much work. It doesn't matter. You know, it's a different mechanism of adaptation that you're gonna be utilizing to arrive to the same end goal. This course is gonna feel different. Well, maybe you are doing that and you're still not seeing results. Okay, let's go the other way now. Add some drop sets, add some strip sets, you know? Take that first set to almost a failure, maybe failure for 12 reps. Strip some weight down, hit another 10 reps. Strip some weight and hit another five reps, failure, okay? You went from doing 12 reps to essentially doing 27 reps. You're still staying within that effective rep range, but now you're doubling the amount of work that you're doing. You know, your goal is still hypertrophy. You're just going about it a different way. Another quick tip here, in order to determine the most effective rep range for each like movement, you can simply Google the split of like fiber muscle types. You know, what's the split on this particular muscle? Like triceps are heavier on fast twitch fiber muscles. So you'll be better served by using lower reps and higher weights for the most part. Like I said, up until you start hitting some roadblocks, then you need to start looking elsewhere. But that's an easy way of like adding some variability 
to your schedules. Now let's talk about strength. Now, like I said, strength is a little bit of a complicated topic and it's important to understand that yes, hypertrophy will help your strength, but it is a known fact that power lifters are stronger than bodybuilders. Same way bodybuilders are stronger than like your average person. So the amount of muscle mass that you have on your frame will have some carryover towards the strength side of things. But at the end of the day, there's a lot more things that play a part into strength. If you look at a relative intensity chart, you'll see that right when you go from like four to five is when you essentially drop from about 90% of your absolute intensity. I think this is why it works this way because five rep max would essentially be equal to about 87 to 88% of your 1RM. And this seems to be like the threshold at which we wanna be in in order to start working towards strength. So keep that in mind. A big component of strength work is being able to do a lot of sets and to accrue volume at these high intensities. But it gets to be very hard. Like if all you're doing is doubles and triples, it gets pretty hard to accrue volume like that. You know, and you'll see these monster sets are just like 10 by twos. You know, and they're just very, very heavy work. So even though your goal is on the strength side of things, you cannot ignore your physical preparedness. I talked about this on the video from last week, like West Side Barbell, how they started including other types of work to drive this like max intensity efforts. And this was the repetition method and the uh, dynamic effort method. Work at lower intensities, okay? Your physical preparedness is still a key component to this because it would increase, it will increase your work capacity and allow you to accrue more work at these high intensities. So that's a big thing to keep in mind that I feel like sometimes it goes overlooked. But yeah, for the most part, strength is really not that complicated, but it's surprisingly hard to do. It's very individual specific and it just takes experience, it takes time. Like what are, the, what, are, what are our weaknesses here? What are we failing on? Which part of the movement are we failing on? How is our technique throughout these movements? You know, it's not just about lifting heavy. Like you have to be a proficient lifter if you wanna be a strong lifter. And that's what makes it a sport. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it fun. Now to go into a bit of a tangent, this is like a personal story. I have never throughout my entire life I have ever dedicated any sort of effort or attention to hypertrophy work ever in my life. I grew up doing Olympic weightlifting when it came to training. I was lucky enough to live in a town that had a weightlifting team. It was in college, I was in high school and those guys still took me in and I was able to train with them. But our focus was on getting strong all the time. You know, and throughout my entire career as a rugby player, I never had any issues with big injuries. All of my issues, all of my injuries came from soft tissue ish issues. You know, little things here that would start aching and I would ignore, you know? And nowadays, I started turning my attention more to hypertrophy work, isolation work, and I've been fixing all these imbalances. And it's just slightly frustrating, a bit infuriating that I went all of these years without ever paying attention to something as simple as hypertrophy work after my training sessions. So even if you're involved in sports, even if you're involved in like strength specific sports, field specific sports, ball sports, things like that, do not disregard hypertrophy work, do not disregard strength work. You know, at the end of the day, staying healthy is the main driver to performance more than anything else. It's just being able to train and being able to compete all year, every year. You know, maybe not all year because you have off seasons and you should have off seasons, but yeah, stay healthy. Don't ignore this side of training, regardless of what your sport is. And that's the video for this week. So hopefully you got something out of it. If you did, I would appreciate it if you leave a comment, like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps quite a bit. And yeah, thanks for watching. It is important to draw wisdom from many different places. If we take it from only one place, it becomes rigid and stale. Understanding others, the other elements, and the other nations will help you become whole. Thank you.